Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining with the Bureau of Standards Jamaica and our partners in this session as we discuss, share information on cosmetics and personal item, personal care items. The Bureau of Standards Jamaica is joined in this presentation by the Jamaica Business Development Corporation, JAMPRO, the Scientific Research Council, and we're very happy to have these entities partnering with us. The Bureau of Standards Jamaica, JBDC, Jamaica, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, and the JAMPRO are all agencies within the Ministry of Industry, Investment, and Commerce, Jamaica's business ministry. One of the aims of the ministry is to make doing business in Jamaica easier. As a result, this initiative, this intervention, seeks to ensure that we share information, valuable information, we believe, that many persons who are seeking to be a part of the cosmetics and the personal care industry will benefit from. We have pulled stakeholders from our entities who are knowledgeable, who understand, who know your needs, and who will share with you. We want to remind all of you who are participating today that this session is an information session. It is not a training session. But all of our entities provide training opportunities. Every single one of these entities provide training opportunities that you can seek to benefit from and to get more information as you seek to improve your product and to improve your opportunities for business here in Jamaica and for export. Today, we are going to be looking at several things. We're going to be looking at standards because we believe that standards are the foundation that will help us ensure that our products that we create for sale here and overseas meet the, requir the requirements as stipulated by these standards. We're gonna be talking therefore about standards in producing the items, in making the items, whether we're doing this from our home or we're doing this from a facility that, which has all of the trappings. We want to ensure that your products are safe for use. We're going to be talking about labeling, packaging, but even before we get to the labeling and packaging, which many of us like and many of us choose our items based on these things, how nicely labeled it is, how beautifully packaged it is, we want to ensure that you have a sense of how to go about doing this business. How can you be effective in maximizing the opportunities from the products that you are creating? We want to ensure that the product, the development, the formulation, you have an idea. You have been doing something at home during COVID, many persons, as I say, take them on, turn fashion. And we started doing things with the things in our homes, with the toner, with the turmeric, with the charcoal, we started doing stuff. And then somebody said, no man, this is good. Let my skin look clean and nice. I feel so well. And people have decided to market these things. So, if you're going to go to market, you want to make sure so the product good. And while the standards exist, and the Bureau of Standards will talk about that, the Scientific Research Council is able to help you improve your product through their product formulation and through the services they offer. In fact, I won't let you into the secret. I think they will about the facilities that they will make available for you and for others who might have an interest, who want to upscale their businesses and who can no longer do this in the spaces that they operate. Additionally, we know say Jamaica and them, we're big. We're big here, so yard, but we want to big abroad. And we're gonna explore the opportunities for export. We're going to explore the opportunities and the requirements 
for export. So all of us together welcome you to this session today. We are very happy to see the number of you who have come and we pray that the information that we share with you today will be helpful. Um, I'm Ellis James Sling and I am in the communication and customer service branch at the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. We are very happy to have on our panel this morning, and I will save the Bureau of Standards team for last, but I really want to welcome and to acknowledge Dr. Shade Foster of the Scientific Research Council, and she will be making a presentation. And this is just basic introductions at this moment. We also do have Mr. Colin Porter, of the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. And representing JAMPRO, we have Mrs. Joan Whitfield. The Bureau of Standards has a, power, a powerful team, including Mrs. Dion Price and Mrs. Paulette Bailey. All of our presenters will be supported by others in their spaces who will assist with questions in the room and who will help to ensure that together we learn. We do ask persons who are not speaking to ensure that their mics remain closed. So please keep your instruments on mute. We also ask that if you do come on camera that your background and the activities are not distracting. We do ask that. When we have presented and we have questions, we will ask you to use a raise hand feature to ensure that we do this in an orderly way. Today, it will be somewhat like a panel discussion. And as I said, we will be introducing each of the presenters and they will speak to the different areas as we explore cosmetics and personal care items as we seek to make a business and we seek to exploit all the opportunities. So, if I might share a personal story, my routine, if you want to talk about face routine, is simply water, not even soap. I don't use soap on my face. I do use soap to bathe. And yes, the bars of soap, personal care items. But as I prepared for work this morning, I really truly considered all the things that we use as we prepare. We get into the shower and we will use a bar of soap or we may use shampoo or body wash. Some persons and the ladies will get into the face scrubs and men too get into the face scrub. And then the ladies will do some little bit more with the makeup. You know, they'll have the base and they'll put on the lipstick and they put on the mascara and they put on all of those things. All of this together. Did we ever consider, maybe we have not, never really considered how much goes into these things until we are seeking to make a business of it, all of what is required. And then we have the colognes and perfumes, we have underarm perspirants, we have all kinds of things. And I will tell you this, that I have to be very careful. I'm just letting you in on this secret and I'm only sharing it with you. So I don't expect anybody else to talk about this after my sinuses will be triggered by fragrances. So as we create our scents, as we create our products, always be mindful of those of us who need to use these things and really would hope that our sinuses are not triggered by the strong fragrances that you use. But then that's just for me. And I know that there are several other persons with their fragrances, with their perfumes and their colognes, who, especially after Valentine's Day and all the packaging, are doing well. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's session. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to a great exchange of ideas and information. Please feel welcomed. May I then invite Dion Price to just tell us a little bit, and I don't know if she's going to do the full presentation, but Dion, let us start with standards, the very basis for operation, if you will. And if you're able to go on camera, can you just please engage us a little bit about standards that are necessary and standards as foundation for your operations?
Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this awareness session on cosmetics. As, as Mr. Leng had indicated, many of us use cosmetics every single day. Sometimes we use a plethora of cosmetics, you know, from our blushes to our eyeliners to something as simple as our body wash, you know, or the lotion that we use every single day. All right, so in terms of standards, though, we would want to know that any product we're using has a standard associated with it. We'd want to know that it is governed by a standard. We'd want to know that we're using standard products. Um, none of us wants to go out there and take up, I'm not sure if any of you have ever had this particular incident happen to you, but I have. Um, I've had you know, particular products that I've taken up and, you know, they're still within their best by dates or use by dates, you know, and the cosmetics we normally see those, you know, after you open it, it's good for another month or so. And in less than a month, we noted that, you know, there were odors, off odors coming from our cosmetics and there's nothing worse than having a cosmetic that we're using smell off while we're wearing it, right? So I think... One of the beautiful things about standards is that it allows us to feel safe. Um, we feel that our product is safe. And not only that, but even as manufacturers, you feel that you're able to give somebody a quality product, something that you can put your name on, something that when you say, you know, this is my brand, you know that it stands for quality. And we wouldn't be able to do that without first understanding what is the requirement of the standard? Um, how does this standard affect how I will operate within my sphere? Um, so in general, for cosmetics, there are, I would say, three suites of standards. It depends on where you're going to, if you're going to export, um, if you're into just selling locally, um, and if you're going to be sending it, for example, to the US or maybe to the UK market. <laughs> In general, we do say, you know, it's the onus is on the cosmetic producer to ensure the safety of your product, but also to know what the requirements are for the market that you're selling to. So, for example, what you might find is that the, the FDA has a particular set of requirements, and those requirements usually have to deal with, still have the similar parameters, but they might ask that the testing be done in a slightly different manner. Um, but you want to know if I'm going to the US, I'm going to use the FDA specs. I'm going to use the FDA way of testing. Um, if I am heading to the UK, then I might want to, you know, parry to the, the ISO set of standards. And it, there is actually there are actually Jamaican standard specifications for cosmetics, even the water that we use in cosmetics, because even that is important. Um, I wanted to go into just a bit more on the microbiology, but I'm going to check in with Mr. Leng and to see if perhaps we want to go to another side of the presentation first um, before we get a little deeper into deep waters, as, as we like to put it into the science of the cosmetics. Uh, Mr. Leng? Thanks, Dion. And, you know, Dion, I want to just ask you a question. And thanks for that information. But you know, we have kind of taken it for granted that when we speak of standards, we just use the word loosely. We, we talk about standards. What, what exactly is a standard, Dion? Well, I was like, you're putting me on the spot, you know. I am. But all right. So for me, when I think of standard, I, I think it is a, a set, a set guideline or a set um way of doing things that continuously gives you a quality outcome. So for example, for me, if I think about a cosmetic, I said, okay, well, the cosmetic shouldn't have, I'm speaking from a microbiological standpoint, it shouldn't have more than this amount of bacteria because more than this amount of bacteria, it will start to spoil on the shelf. Um, it's not going to be helpful for the clients because it's probably going to cause skin infections, etc. So I want to know that it is sometimes it's an agreed upon um, set of parameters for a particular product. So for example, um, in some cases, what you might find is that suppose it is a natural product, maybe the counts need to be a little bit higher and that's still acceptable. 
but I would say it would be a list of acceptable parameters for a particular product. Thank you so very much. Thank you so that would very be much. My working that. Definition. Yeah, and you know, and you say for you, but really for all of our participants today, a standard is really a set of defined requirements. So it is established and through the Bureau of Standards Jamaica, we, along with persons who are experts in industry, and some of you who are doing your cosmetics, you are experts already, and there are some others who over time will become experts. We all sit together in committees and we work at developing these standards. So we call these standards, these are guideline documents. And for those persons who have not yet started the business, who just ask about, sure that you check in with the Bureau of Standards Jamaica through the Technical Information Center, where you are able to review the standards. You can purchase the standards, but if you're not able to purchase it initially, at least if you're going to do the business, you want to make sure you get it right from the start. Don't bother start with hiccups and then come back to it. So thank you very much for that, Dion, and for helping us understand. But you see, you are a, you are a microbiologist, so you can go in and talk about all that bacteria thing, but that is where we depend on you, the scientific research to help us get it right, because we don't have all of that technical knowledge for like bright people like you. So we need you at the BSJ and the SRC to set the stage. Thank you, Dion. We're gonna hear a little bit more from Shade at this point, and then we'll come right back to you. All right. Well, if I may interject, though, Mr. Lang, um, there is also just from the just for I guess the the, the importance of mention, um, persons may not be aware of which standards they should try and get. Um, the Jamaican standards. There are a number of Jamaican standard specifications for cosmetics. Um, those are usually in the the JSCRS suite with like J, JSCRS 170, um, that particular set of standards speak to cosmetics specifically. There's also the ISO standards, such as the ISO 29621, which give you guidelines for risk assessment. Um, there's also the ISO 17516, which gives you the actual microbiological limits for cosmetics. Um, the Bacteriological Analytical Manual is available online, and that's actually a free resource that also, um, that's from the FDA, and they give you specifications as well for the products. And ISO also has an actual um, GMP guideline that is available as well. Um, and I believe that is ISO 22716. So some of those are, I think, worthy of name mention. There's a lot more in terms of the, the standards that are available, and those are definitely available at the, the TIC. But those ones, I believe, deserve a bit, a bit of honorable mention, if I may say so. Thank you so very much for this honorable mention. I look at this listing, and I'm seeing at least one, two, three, four, five standards with several parts and I have the list available here and the technical information center and they can be contacted at TIC at bsj.org.jm they would be prepared to take your inquiries so please reach out to that entity the TIC TIC at bsj.org.jm for more information on standards thank you so very much for that and with that foundation I want us to hear a little bit more about how we really go about developing these products. You know, I used to come from country and long time ago, you know, nobody really wanted to drink aloe vera. They call it two of them time they are sinker Bible, sinker Bible. But we knew that, for example, that was good to use in the washing of hair. And in fact, some persons actually use it for some skin conditions. But of course, this is just country and this is just granny living. You know, as we have gone through the years, we have found ways of improving on these processes, on these products and putting them in our shelves. The Scientific Research Council, and if you hear the name Scientific Research Council, they help 
persons who are seeking to establish their business operations who and they help in terms of the technical material they will sit with you and help no I mean, no so jamaican people like to hold it in close to them chest because they don't trust nobody with them information but if we want to get it right we have to get technical help the scientific research council provides a wealth of information and a wealth of resources to its several units and departments. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Shade Foster, who has been working with us on this project, share with us. And I'm going to invite Dr. Shade Foster to come now and to share in this presentation as she helps us understand the principles of developing the product, product formulation, all them little things that we need to know so that we can kind of make a little money and that me ED and the minister won't sideline me too much, but we can do a little business from the side. Good morning, everyone. You're seeing me? All right. Um, seeing and hearing you. Share my presentation with you guys. Wow. Uh, All right, so you're seeing the presentation. No. Yesterday. Yes, we are. Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of this session. Um, I hope the information provided thus far is very useful to you. Um, so today I'm not going to go into the details of formulating your product but to look at safety the importance of safe safety in, um, as a manufacturer how you can safeguard your personal care products and let you know about some of the services that src provides so i'm going to look at the significance of testing discuss safety tests and efficacy testing See how you safeguard your personal care products as a manufacturer, as I mentioned, the type of analysis you can do on your personal care products and I'll speak to you about how SRC supports the industry. All right, so why is testing important? Manufacturers are responsible for ensuring the safety of their products. So while testing does not guarantee that the products will work for every individual due to the differences in you know, skin type and skin set here type sensitivity, depending on, you know, whatever the product is, it sets a reasonable expectation and risk avoidance for the general public. Rigorous testing helps to ensure that your cosmetic ingredients and the final products are safe and effective and does not make misleading claims. So Without proper testing, your ingredient could cause harm or not actually provide the benefits advertised, right? So reputable cosmetic in companies invest heavily in testing of their products um, to protect their customers and to build brand trust. So, and, and, and for the customer, it means a peace of mind that the product they're, they're buying is gentle and non-irritating and does what is promised. Now, cosmetic manufacturers adopt two strategies to ensure that their products are safe and effective. One is safety testing and the other is efficacy testing. So safety testing, as the name suggests, assess the safety of a product and the ingredients to ensure that they do not pose any significant risk to the customer health and when it's used as directed. It determines the appropriate le usage level of um, I realized my mic was muted a while ago. You guys hearing me now? Yes, yes, we're hearing you, but yeah. I, think I think we were just having a little bit of mid-morning um, Tuesday, 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 Tuesday partying and I think there was a little challenge here but please continue okay so your safety test determines the appropriate usage level and who should use certain ingredients and um 
It also assess the health risk and guarantee that the substance won't cause any long-term negative effects or unexpected side effects when used as directed. Now, for e efficacy testing, the purpose of an efficacy test is to prove that the product delivers its promised benefits. So safety uh, tests ensure safety, efficacy, it delivers what is promised. So if you are making any claims like the product causes a wrinkle reduction or it brightens and hydrates the skin, these factors must be evaluated. Efficacy testing basically proves that the ingredient does what it claims, as I said. So both efficacy testing and safety testing are often conducted using in vitro testing. So it could be cell-based or chemical-based or in vivo testing, which may involve animals or humans. The testing method depends on the specific requirements and the ethical consideration. Now, I know some of the eyebrows may have raised a while ago when I mentioned human study, but a human study could be as simple as a dermatologist using advanced technology to evaluate the skin of a test subject before and after the use of a product. And this impartial inspection of the skin may determine if the product is effective for the intended purpose. Now, like many other countries, Jamaica faces certain limitation when it comes to conducting efficacy testing, right? So one of these limitations is the cost for testing and research. Now, efficacy testing is really research, which requires money and can take some time. However, once the funding is available, SRC may be able to do the research. So we would do our evaluation to see if we uh, look at looking at the appropriate testing method, the required equipment, the expertise that may be needed. We would draft a project proposal. We may also need to collaborate with other research institutions like University of the West Indian and uh, universities abroad. And your proposal would include a budget and we would have to engage in some kind of contractual arrangement. But again, as I said, this will take some time to execute and it requires significant investment, right? Now, in many countries, regulatory agencies focus primarily on safety testing to ensure that the personal care product do not pose any significant risk to consumer health. And safety testing is critical because while a product must provide a benefit, it promise it should do so without causing any harm to the user. All right, so I have a little did you know here. Did you know in the early 1900s, Women use a product called Lash Lore Sorry. to darken their eyelashes. The product contained toxic chemicals and caused blindness in some users, leading to a ban on the product in 1938. Did you know? All right, so I have a little video here that I want to share. Um, hold on. Okay. Imagine treating yourself to an eyelash and brow tint and ending up blind in the night. Imagine treating yourself to an eyelash and brow tint and ending up blind. In the 1930s, that's exactly what happened to one woman, Mrs. Hazel Fay. Imagine treating yourself to an eyelash and brow tint and ending up blind. 
in the 1930s, that's exactly what happened to one woman. Mrs. Hazel Faye Brown stopped by Bird's Beauty Shop before a PTA banquet given in her honor. There, she was persuaded to get a brow and lash tint with an eyelash beautifier known as Lash Lore. In the moments following her visit, her eyes began to sting with pain. Two hours later, she could hardly see. For the next two months, Ms. Brown would suffer extreme pain and destruction of her eyeballs that would ultimately lead to her becoming totally blind forever with no hope of recovery. And Mrs. Brown wasn't the only one. The Journal of the American Medical Association reported at least 17 similar incidents and it's possible many more were not reported. What happened? The Lashler Eye Beautifier contained a chemical known to cause extreme allergic reactions in some people. The offending molecule, paraphenylenediamine, also known as PPD. A hexagon-shaped ring with a nitrogen and two hydrogens attached to opposite ends. Why was a product like this on the market? Because in the 1930s, existing regulations like the 1906 Food and Drug Act provided little protection to consumers. Sure, the law prohibited contaminated and misbranded products, but it offered no specifics on how to enforce the law and harmful cosmetics weren't even included. Worse yet, the FDA had approved the sellers of these harmful products were being knowingly deceptive. Motivated by earlier cases similar to the Lashler tragedy, the FDR administration worked to reform the 1906 Food and Drug Act in hopes of providing better consumer protection. It seems so obvious to us now that being injured by your makeup is a problem. But in 1933, the administration had to communicate to the public and Congress why these new protections were necessary. They assembled an exhibit of potentially dangerous products that was displayed at the 1933 Chicago World Fair. It included products like Kremlu, a permanent hair removal cream that used thallium acetate, an ingredient in rat poison, and Gros Oriental Cream, which caused bluish black gums and loss of teeth, thanks to mercury compounds, and of course, Lashlor. The display was shocking enough that one journalist dubbed it the American Chamber of Horrors. The display awoke the public consciousness and had the support of many women's groups, including the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt herself. Unfortunately, the first legislative attempts to strengthen consumer protections were a disaster. They were viciously opposed by industry, trade groups, and advertisers in a five-year legislative battle that didn't end until 1938. 100 people, mostly children, died after taking a drug called sulfonilamide. They were poisoned by diethylene glycol, a toxic liquid with a sweet taste. Only then did the Federal Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938 pass into a law. It tightened the regulations on food and drugs, and cosmetics were regulated for the first time. Lashler was the first product confiscated once the act was passed, and the FDA issued a statement saying PPD in eyelash tints was considered contamination, a rule the FDA still adheres to to this day. So happy ending or all safe, right? Maybe. All right. All right, so I hope that video was kind of emphasize the importance of having standards and regulations in the cosmetic industry. And it, this, this incident of the lady going blind um, was, this, was kind of propelled it forward, but it also brought attention to the cosmetic, the, all this incident, the, the pharmaceutical industry, you know, based on those children falling ill. All right. So, as I stated earlier, your manufacturers and or distributors of cosmetics product are legally responsible for ensuring that the market marketed product is safe for consumer and is used according to the direction on the label. So product testing is just one of the things that a manufacturer need to do to ensure the safety of their cosmetic product. One other step that can be employed is to adhere to GMP guidelines. So as mentioned earlier, there are guidelines out there and um, the guidelines basically outline the requirements for various components of manufacturing, right? And it will just, and I will just mention some of it here without going into too much detail.
So it speaks to your facility requirements. So, you know, a facility, facility should be clean and hygienic with adequate space, storage, packaging, for storage and packaging, and it should prevent contamination, right? And ensure proper vent, designed to prevent contamination and ensure proper ventilation. Um, it speaks to your training personnel and personnel that, that are involved in manufacturing. Um, but, and testing and handling of your cosmetic product must be adequately trained. They must be aware of hygienic practices, product safety protocol, and how to handle your raw materials and your finished product. Um, GMP emphasizes the importance of sourcing your material from reputable suppliers. So manufacturers must maintain a record of their raw material and their specifications. Uh, manufacturing processes, these, pro these processes must be carried out in a controlled manner to minimize contamination and to ensure product consistency. Manufacturers must implement testing protocol to verify an ident the, the identity and purity of and stability of your cosmetic product, as well as assess for microbial safety. So GMP requires that thorough documentation is kept. Um, your testing results, your quality control activities must be recorded and um, it allows for traceability and accountability. Right, so should something go wrong, you're able to trace which batch this per was produced um, that has the issue, and you know we can withdraw it from the market. Packaging and labeling. The GMP guideline extend to packaging and labeling of your cosmetic products to so ensure that they're properly sealed and their products are maintained, maintain their integrity and safety. And your labeling must accurately reflect the content of your product. So all ingredients must be listed. So they are listed in descended order of prominence and the usage instruction should be clear and any applicable warning or, or precaution must be stated on your label. And finally, storage and distribution. Manufacturers are responsible to ensure that they're proper storage condition for your raw material and your finished product to prevent degradation and contamination. So the rules that applies to regular manufacturing um, gym applies to the cosmetic industry. All right. So one of the main step, step of ensuring safety and quality of your ingredients. Another one is to ensure that you choose quality ingredients through reputable suppliers, right? So you um your suppliers should be able to provide you information about your product. So you're going to ensure that you do some um auditing of your suppliers right, choose a reputable organization um, who actually carry out testing on their product, right? So these testing will evaluate the ingredients, what they will react to, how they react with the human tissue, how they react with the environment. And they test for skin irrit irritations, maybe they'll tell you if the product needs to be stored away from light because it will react with light. They'll speak about allergic reaction. They'll talk about um, any hazards and just certain qualities about your the, the ingredients, the raw material. All of this information that is gathered from the various testing is used to generate uh, what we call a safety data sheet, right? So a safety data sheet, um, about your cosmetic ingredients that can, are available at your suppliers. And the safety information may also be posted on the business website. And in some cases, a printed copy of the SDS may be provided upon purchasing of your ingredients. So as manufacturers, we need to pay attention to this, um, the safety data. So what information is on the safety data? 
sheet. So it speaks to the product and the company information, the company name, uh, reference number, so you can track the batch again, product description, so general information, chemical composition, stability, reactivity, those information can be found, hazardous information. So how do you handle and store your, your this chemical? Um, any first aid measures it tell you about usage level how you how would you dispose of the product uh, what to do if should there be a spillage right all right so a little bit on product testing and certification so the type of test that is conducted is dependent on the type of product and we find that the most objective testing comes from third party service, service or a lab. So yes, you may be, to, may be able to do some internal testing, some sensory evaluation, you know, look, give product to your potential customers and friends and, and family, but it is best to use a third party test, do per, third party testing from an organization whose results are accepted by your regulatory bodies right and as mentioned earlier the type of testing again is dependent on the product so here i have a list of some common tests that you can do on your personal care product with a lotion body wash shampoo um, and the ones i list here in black are tests that is executed at src so you may want to do your product stability testing pH testing, we provide service or rancidity and specific gravity, heavy metal, preservative and efficacy testing is something that you may want to do, um, but we it's not a service provided, currently it's provided here at SRC, you can look at the microbial content and the micro um, moisture content. So the type of test you do, I would say, is guided by your regulator organization. So if it is that you are planning on exporting your product to Europe or to US, you would select tests based on their regulations, right? Um, here now you would be, uh, also you would be guided by the standards that are available, right? All right, so looking at stability testing, I'm just going to quick briefly tell you about these tests, you know, what information you would gain from doing these analysis. So stability of a product can be assessed through real-time or accelerated stability testing. So your accelerated stability or thermal stability Testing is a method of predicting how long a product will remain stable at low temperature by subjecting it to higher temperature to speed up the process of degradation. So in other words, you have a product, you want to see how long, what will happen to your product after a year. So you can, you, um, you, the scientists, for example, can subject the product to certain condition in the humidity chamber or incubator for a short period of time, for example, two months. So you see what will happen to your product in one year by testing it for two months, right? So is, that is accelerated shelf life study. Now with real stability study, that is. So with real-time stability now, the product is assessed in, as the name suggests, real-time. So you're going to leave it there for one year, using the same example, to see what will happen. And over time, you can perform various testing. For example, you can assess the, mi the microbial content um, every three months to see how well the preservative system is holding up. Or you may do the, assess the viscosity to determine if there's any structural degradation. Um, so currently SRC offers a service of real-time stability testing. We have acquired a humidity chamber for accelerated stability testing. However, we are, it is not fully operational yet, so that testing service is not being offered, but someday probably in the future. Another test you may want to consider is your pH 
test. So the pH or how acidic or how alkaline uh, product or cosmetic item is plays a critical role in determining its ability to work well with the skin to maintain its effectiveness and promote health, healthy hair, for example, if it's a hair product and preserve the product, right? So just to look at the scale a little bit. So the pH scale ranges from one to four. Seven B neutral, so it would be the pH of your water. Um, if you move down the scale from seven to smaller number, you it becomes more acidic. And if you move up from seven, it becomes more basic. So the pH of the skin, of your natural skin, range between 4.5 and 5.5, which is slightly acidic. So you want to develop your product with a pH level close to the range of the skin so that the product is gentler and less irritating, right? pH also affects the stability and efficacy of your cosmetic products. So with certain ingredients, you being more unstable are more stable within a certain pH range. And it's, I mentioned skin here, but the same apply to your product. Your hair is affected by pH. If it's too acidic or too basic, it can cause damage. So some regulatory compliance require product to undergo pH testing and ultimately optimizing the pH of your product may ensure product safety, right? And enhance customer satisfaction and loyalty. So this is just another test. Rancidity is another test that you can do. The oil component of your cosmetic preparation and the final products are typically assessed for rancidity. And you can check the finished product freshness and shelf life for the items, for items like sunscreens, lotion, creams to ensure safety, eff effectiveness, and it's aesthetically pleasing to your market that you're reaching out to. All right, uh, another test you may want to do is a viscosity test. So viscosity measures the fluid flow resistance. So higher viscosity means slower flow. So looking at this picture here, um, you can see that this clear ingredient um, product is more viscous than the one in yellow, because this one flows better, fast, faster, and this one flows slower. So we know that viscosity influences customers' preference. So some users believe that the more viscous a product is, the better it is. Products with the right viscosity is easier to apply, to spread, and it meets customer expectation. But the reason for testing is that testing is important because um, Changes in viscosity over time can indicate issues with issues like ingredient separation and degradation. This is before you can actually see visual separation. You can know that your product is unstable. Um, regular testing identified variation in your formulation or the processing parameter. So the manufacturing processing can affect the integrity of your. So this is another test you can do. And as mentioned by a microbiologist now, your personal care products like your lotion, shampoo, makeup product that contains water can be a breeding ground for harmful bacteria. So microbial testing on your personal care product is also important to ensure that they are safe and comply to safety standard. And it will help to identify any com contamination during the manufacturing and prevent potential problem caused that can be caused by these microbes. So your microbial analysis may include tests for yeast and mold, Staphylococcus aureus, coliform, E. coli, aerobic mesophilic microorganism, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So SRC offer testing services for all these analysis mentioned here, um, except for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 
And we also offer testing for other microbes that are not listed here. All right, so quick question here. Um, you can answer by raising your hands or open your mic. You can open your mic and respond. Raise your hand and identify you and can respond. So what heavy metal commonly found in some skin lightening cream has been banned in many countries due to its severe health risk, including kidney damage, skin lesion, and neurological disorders. Uh, well, I might be able to see the chat. Okay, somebody already answered arsenic. Yes, the answer is arsenic. So, way back in the 80s, some people use arsenic to whiten their skin and the practice was dangerous and often led to poisoning and the death. And we also, even though we are, this is not cosmetics, arsenic was also used in some dyings to use as dyeing. I think it's mainly for green color dyes um, of clothes. And it is a heavy metal, which can lead to lots of health issues. So heavy metals, it's like arsenic, candium, um, cobalt, lead, mercury, nickel, these are elements that are naturally present in the earth. And they are among a group of substances com substance commonly referred to as heavy metals. So heavy metals can be harmful when absorbed in the skin or ingested. They have been linked to various issues ranging from irritation to allergy to more serious conditions like neurological disorders, kidney damage, and even cancer and death, as mentioned before, right? So regular testing ensure that the product meets safety standard and regulation requirement, safeguarding your customer health and well-being by detecting and preventing heavy metal contamination, right? So I'm wrapping up now, but I'm just going to quickly inform you of how SRC, so how does SRC support personal care industry? And SRC does this through the natural product unit by offering the following services. So we do product develop, personal care product development. So if you have an idea for a product and you need assistance for developing that product, we can assist. In the end, the formulation will belong to you, right? So, um, so our host mentioned you may have some type of aloe vera. You have a bunch of aloe vera at home. You want to develop a product with aloe vera in it. You can reach us to us. Tell us what specific product you're interested in doing, and we will see how best we can assist you with product development. Product standardization is another area we assist with so product standardization involves creating a product that follows specific guidelines so our specification and you have quality control measures in place to ensure that you have a consistent and safe product so you may already have a product available and you have some concerns maybe it's a concerns with stability um or proper documentation of your formulation, your product consistency, et cetera, we can assist you. So this service could include ensure that, ensuring that your product adhere to ingredients restriction. So you make a product, you want to make sure that you're not too, you, using too much of any particular ingredient. So for example, preservative, you, you don't want to use too much or too little because if it's too little, then you will find that you have microbe growing in your product at a faster, a fast rate. Whereas it's if it's too much, sometimes these preservatives can cause too much of a particular preservative may cause harm to your to the customer health. And not only that, for just because 
on the preservative example, certain ingredient preservative based on the regulation, you have to keep the keep it within a, a range, right? So a limit. So like in the U in Europe, something like Germal Plus, you if it's over five percent or 0.5 percent of your product. Right, so if the quantity is above 0.5% of your product, they would not accept your product in their country or on the market, right? So that's just an example of how we assist. So we can assist, again, with converting your recipe into a formulation. So your formulation should be written a certain way. We usually write it by percentage, by weight, and not by volume. So if you have something like that, we can assist with you and we can help with um, recording all the standardized activities. So the instruction and so forth in your of, your, of producing your formulation. Uh, we do chemical and microbial testing, as mentioned before, and we provide a personal care product development training workshop. So we, each year we try to offer at least about four or six workshops ranging from shampoo, body wash, lotion, cream, um, soap making, right? And um, at a cost, of course. At this workshop though, we, the intent is that when you, you leave, you should be able to at least start to develop your own product based on your experience because you have a theory session and then you have the practical session where you actually go into the lab and get hands-on experience in producing your product. All right, we have a soap making pilot plant facility. So what we find is that persons will come to the workshop, they develop their products, they decide to start their business at home in their kitchen or a small space. And if there's a demand for scale up, they don't have this, the space, the facility or the resources to actually scale up. So SRC actually started to develop. What we want to have is a personal care incubator center, pilot plant facility. At this point, we start to set up the space with for soap making, right? Um, the intent is, intent is to expand to other personal care products, but we are currently offering the service for soap making. You can come use the space and the equipment um, to do your product your production um so and then other service that we offer is a uh, consultation services so if you need technical assistance or anything like that we can assist you so those are the services provided by oh and research and development so i did mention that we have a shampoo making workshop so coming up at march 7 we have a shampoo making workshop um, if you're interested, you can attend. You can just the, the information is posted on our social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can register for that. And this, I've just decided to share some photos of the pilot plant space. So this is this the space. Um this photos of production. So production that was done. And there it is. All right, so I have a quick question here. There's a token for this question. The first person to answer will receive a token. So list five services provided by SRC that supports the cosmetic and personal care product industry. Personal care product development, mm -hmm. product standardization services, soap making pilots, plan facility, consultation, and um, training workshops for personal care development. Okay. Um, I hope the team from Bureau got that person's name and information so that and we can raise, put, raise your hand again so I can write it down. My name is Sabrina Hilton.
Okay, so we'll try and reach out to you regarding that. All right. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Wow, thank you so much today. Thank I you. Mean, SRC. You see the number of things that SRC can provide for us? No, I will have to go find all of my sink Bible or go on at the back of the yard because we have to try to get upon this. Thank you so much, Shade Foster. Shade mm -hmm. is a biochemist and is currently the team leader of the natural products unit of the SRC. And the natural products unit, as she said, is responsible for assisting in the personal care cosmetic project product industry. We really have learned quite a bit. So tell me now, and this is not a fun fact, but it might be a, a fun, well, it's not quite so fun. I see some ladies and I like to say that these eyelashes look quite like umbrellas. Are our ladies putting themselves at risk with some of these eye extensions, we'll call it extensions on our, we'll call it now, eyelids? Shadi, talk to me because when you're here, when I saw what you said earlier, spider, <coughs> Danny, are you one? No, me not gonna make nobody lick me about spider eyelashes. But, you know, um, are people putting themselves at risk when they do some of these cosmetics, use some cosmetics or some uh, things to make themselves look a little bit more attractive? Could you tell us, Shadi, based on the example you shared from the 1800s? Oh, the, the lash lower example? Yeah, the lash -lower. All right, so we have come a far away you know, in terms of putting in place standards and regulation. You saw in the video that there was some amount of resistance in, um, and it actually took five years before, after identifying that this thing has been causing blindness for it to be taken off the market, right? So, but we have learned a lot from all of that and there are as we, standards and regulations in place to make sure that we don't have these reoccurring problems. The sad thing about it is that sometimes somebody actually have to experience some ill health for these measures to be put in place. But persons here today, our manufacturers here is going to make sure that they do everything that they need to do to make sure that these products are safe. And surprisingly, when I was looking up the Lash Lore, there's actually a company named Lash Lore, you know, that <laughs> that is on the market now wow. with the same eyeliner and the same false eyelash. But I'm that hoping that they would, they would have but learned from the example, as you said. And I don't standards. know if it's coming from that time, but they would have made their adjustment you know, to their formulation and so forth so that it is actually safe. All right. Thank you so mm -hmm. much today. Thanks for your very interesting, very informative, really full of information. And we just assure the persons who have asked, the presentation will be available and you will be able to get that. Thank you so very much. But we will take one question, one single solitary question from Nikisha Ibanks, and then we move on to our next set of presentations. Nikisha, please go ahead, unmute and ask. Thank you. Um, good morning again, everyone. So um, I think um, it's faster. So let's say I get all of my products from a reputable manufacturer that would have gone through the testing, um, the standards and all of that. They are up to date. And the only thing I want to do is get the product. Um, they would bottle the product for me and only thing for me to do is put my label with my brand and the product do me do I have to do all of those requirements just the same like the testing and etc no if it is as you said they have done all the testing before because basically what you're doing is repackaging right yeah. so they've made a product They've done all the tests. You just need to make sure you have all the documentation and specification for that product should anything go wrong and you need to trace any anything. So 
somebody get, got harmed or there's a contaminated batch on the market, you're able to go back and say, okay, well, it's coming from X batch. And so we can pull that batch of products from the market. Okay, thank you very Just much. Just make sure you have the information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Nikisha, thank you for that question. And just to indicate that Dr. Shade Foster can be contacted at 876-927-17714. That's the Scientific Research Council. Thank you again, Shade, for your presentation. And thanks to our audience for your keen listening and viewing. So we have been sharing quite a bit about standards and earlier on you will recall that Dion Price of the Bureau of Standards gave us a sense of what are standards and she kind of outlined how we start the process at that place. Dion Price, Mrs. Dion Price is a microbiologist. She's currently the acting manager of the microbiology branch at the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. She comes to us with a wealth of knowledge, lots of experience as well. She has a BSc in microbiology and a master of philosophy in biochemistry with a specific application to microbiology. So we invite Mrs. Dion Price to make her presentation now as she continues to share with you the importance of testing and the services afforded by the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. Immediately following that, because we are just kind of putting the, the thing together so you see the, 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 the line, Mrs. Paulette Bailey will speak to us about labeling. And I did hear Nikisha say, if all I have to do is to purchase from this person and then put on my labeling, and Paulette Bailey, Mrs. Paulette Bailey will help us understand what we need to do to ensure proper labeling of our products. So let us in, invite Mrs. Dion Price to speak to us. All right, thank you, Mr. Lang. Just verifying you are seeing my presentation, yes? Seeing it, not in presentation mode yet, but seeing it. Yes, there you go. All right, so um, hi again, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. And Shadi, thank you so much for just a wealth of knowledge. That was an amazing presentation. Um, Shadi has already covered a lot of the stuff that I will mention, but I will throw a few things in there and hopefully you'll get some nice morsels to, to chew over as you, you know, look to product produce your cosmetics and as you probably some of you are already in manufacturing and maybe it's something that can help you along the way all right so microbiology and cosmetics I will tell anyone that you know microbiology is simply put we look at small stuff <laughs> you know it is we, we're looking at the biological um aspect of just the cosmetics that we're producing. We're looking at things that are too small to see with the naked eye, which means usually um, as it relates to food safety, we would say, you know, if you have a food, you know, that looks okay, it doesn't actually mean that it is okay. So you can have a dish, you went to a restaurant, it looks amazing. And the next thing you find out is that you are stuck in your bathroom for a really long time. The same thing can happen, not necessarily stuck in your bathroom, but it's usually as it relates to things like skin infections and even eye infections, as it relates to microbiology, that you get a cosmetic and it, it smells lovely, it looks beautiful, you apply it and the next thing you know, you have a rash. Or the next thing you know, you know, there is uh, inflammation happening because there's an infection caused by it a microbe that is within the product. Usually for me, I tell clients we look for two things. You're looking for spoilage organisms. You're looking for organisms that are going to um, increase over time um, in such a way that it's going to be you know, bad for your product. The other thing you want to look at, you want to make sure it doesn't have too much bacteria. And the other thing you want to make sure it doesn't have any harmful bacteria. So for my, our microbiologists, we study um, the bacteria, the 
fungi, most times in our lab, we don't study viruses simply because it, you know, it requires a higher biosafety level, usually a class three or a class four lab to do that, um, simply because of the nature of viruses. Um, one of the things that we, we, we want to say, you know, as we know, microbiology, microbiologically speaking, germs are so small that thousands of them can fit on a pinhead. Now, if thousands of them can fit on a pinhead, can you imagine one gram or two grams or four grams of product, how much bacteria could possibly be in it if we do not employ the proper good manufacturing practices that Shadi had mentioned before? So it's very important that for the production of our cosmetics that we're looking at, okay, what are the possible sources of bacteria? What are the possible sources of um, fungi and even possibly protozoans who might be in, depending on the type of water that we're using. It's why there are standards that say, you know, the type of water that you use should not contain, say for example, I think it is greater than 250 bacteria. It should have between zero to two coliforms and it should have no pseudomonads. Like, Things like that, where you have standards like that for even the water that you use in your cosmetics, um, there's a reason why that is. And that's because you want to ensure that at the end of the day, the product that you make is not going to cause harm to anybody, as should I should have mentioned before. So where do we find these germs? We find them everywhere, just everywhere. I mean, our hair, our hands, or, you know, even the nasal mucosa, like everywhere. You know, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the soil, it's on the plants. So, which means that every single thing that you're putting into your product is a source of microbial contamination. It's a possible source of microbial contamination. In some cases, of course, when you're using particular chemicals that are just intrinsically harsh, of course, microbes will not be present in that. They're just intrinsically sterile for that reason. However, there are extremophiles, but we don't expect those to, to grow in your product, to be honest. Um, so when we take our, go to our manufacturing um, facility, we want to make sure that since we know that the microbes are everywhere, we're also controlling for the microbes and how they're gonna get into our product and how they're gonna affect it. Now, in terms of the importance of microbiology to the cosmetic industry, one of the things we would we, we say is that, you know, one, it helps, we help to develop methods to prevent, sorry, this is food, but um, this is really cosmetic spoilage, um, as well as testing of the cosmetic products to see if there is any safety hazard. So, um, for example, we'll check for things like candida albicans um, can be looked for, you might look for Pseudomonas or Staphylococcus aureus, because those organisms are able to oftentimes cause skin infection. Some persons will know of babies who have had things, what we call staph scalding. Um, this is where the Staphylococcus aureus infects the skin, and then you end up with the skin peeling off. There's blisters everywhere. Now, can you imagine? Normally, that is due to unhygienic conditions, but can you imagine if you had a product that you were using on a baby that had staph aureus in it, the child has maybe little abrasions or something, maybe they fell, and because of that, an infection started, um, and that resulted in them ending up in the hospital because of staph scalding, like that would be something that we wouldn't want to happen, and so why is it so important that we ensure the safety of our products by testing it? Now, Various microorganisms are actually used in the production of additives for cosmetics. So, you know, there is the good, the bad, and the ugly. I personally believe that, you know, my little microbes are good, some of them. So, you know, we look at things such as the production of pigments and fragrances. Sometimes we even have probiotics that are incorporated into some creams because there are some persons who have might have um, conditions like eczema where the probiotics help to restore the skin microbiome. As we said before, there are ba there's bacteria everywhere. There's bacteria on our skin. A lot of times we have very good bacteria on our skin, which is why even when we use different cosmetics and stuff, we want to make sure that we are not harming our intrinsic bacteria that we have. Uh, we want to keep them safe and healthy. Um, we also want to make sure that um, 
we don't end up in a situation where even if we're using these probiotics in our cosmetics, that they're not at levels that would cause harm, um, which is why there's a lot of um, testing and ensuring the safety of or um, cosmetics that use biopreservatives. So that is also a thing, <laughs> you know, bacteria and fungi that are able to help preserve your cosmetic. There's also things like production of fatty acids, enzymes, peptides, vitamins, using via fermentation. Um, even something that we, a lot of persons know is you know, like hyaluronic acid, which is produced by Bacillus subtilis. You know, honorable mentions from the bacteria out there. You know, cheers. But um, sorry, the nerdy me is coming out. Um, but one of the things about the microbes, so even though they have they have different um, roles in cosmetics, whether it be in the production of it or us testing for the safety or to prevent the spoilage, um, a lot of this can be controlled or helped by how we employ our good manufacturing practices. So what when we're establishing our manufacturing um, company, do we take into consideration the training of our employees? Like how much training are we putting into knowing that, helping our employees know that, knowing about good hygiene, the sources of microbial contamination, um, knowing that in terms of even our formulations and how to making sure that the formulation that we're using is actually um, effective and ensuring that, you know, we don't where, where it is important for the formulation to have a particular percentage of something that we're not, you know, like, for example, I think in Jamaica, we have a ten tendency to be very willy-nilly with how we apply chemicals. So we're like, you know, these are tubes at bleach. What is a tubes? Like, what exactly is a tubes? Um, so in, in the same way, sometimes we're applying our preservatives and we say, oh, this should be enough. But have we actually established that it needs five grams? to one liter kind of thing, you know what I mean? And ensuring that when we train our personnel, they're actually following the formulation to the T. Additionally, you know, how we transport our things, are we putting our um, cosmetics into nice clean buckets if it requires any kind of refrigeration or some of the raw ingredients require refrigeration, are we applying that? Are, are buildings and facilities, are they adequate? You know, are they clean? Or do they prevent infestation of rodents? You know, are we looking at our pest control? Um, the other things, you know, the equipment and utensils, you know, are they rusting? Are they, have, do they, are they easy to clean? Can we figure out where in our, you know, over time equipment degrade over time, you might find that the utensils are not as good as they used to be, or they might find that cleaning them is a little bit more difficult. You might need to deep clean, you know, are we putting these things in place or do we, have we written this into our procedures in how we're manufacturing our, our cosmetics? Additionally, when we talk about the processing, you know, does our process make sense? You know, some persons believe that you literally can, I can take some turmeric, I can take some aloe vera, I'm going to throw them together and mix it together and I'm going to have a product. And that's not exactly how it works. Um, you might realize that some particular, you have to understand your own process and know your own raw materials. Raw materials such as turmeric or anything that is natural coming from the ground is going to have a higher microbial load, for example, than something that is maybe commercially processed. That's just a fact. Um, it also might not have some of the enzymatic properties that you want, and therefore there is a trade-off. So if I have a raw material such as turmeric or aloe vera, have I gotten it sufficiently clean? Um, when I put it in my product, is the are the microorganisms that are present in the turmeric in such a high load going to cause my product to fail? That is something that we have to look at. Um, additionally, you're going to look at your packaging. Your packaging can affect how long your product is going to last on the shelf. It can also affect um, how quickly the product will spoil once it's opened. So for example, what you might find is that you'll have a product that is in a jar. People are going to keep putting their hands in there. Your hands are going to have microbes. You're going to reintroduce microbes into the product every time they open it. Um, does your product have enough sufficient preservative to handle that? And if it doesn't, maybe it needs to be in a different type of container where there's a dispensing action or a single dose so that the persons don't keep recontaminating it and they have the risk of it um, going bad over time, right? So the other thing is that in terms, as we said, you know, 
our products need to be safe. Um, and in order to do that, we need good manufacturing um, practices. One of the things for our cosmetics is that we want to have consistent products. We want to have a good reputation. We want people to keep coming back and buying our product. We want someone to use it and to say, this product is amazing. I need to make sure that I use it everywhere and I and nothing travels faster than bad news. Once you have a product out there and it's either spoiling on the shelf or it is spoiling it with somebody who used it or it has caused an infection, that person is going to tell another person who's going to tell another person who's going to tell their friends. And that is going to end up with damaging your brand and it's going to cost you more money and you could end up in lawsuits. And so one of the things is that you want to employ good manufacturing practices to make sure the safety of your product. Additionally, so for us in our microbiology lab here, we do um, a number of tests on cosmetics. Um, some of them, usually we do very routine analysis, such as an Arabic pay count, a yeast and mold count, and what we can call a sterility test. There are, however, additional testing that can be done um, and depending on the use of it. So for example, you might find, it's not really cosmetics per se, but um, in some cases you have pharmaceuticals. Um, it might be a pharmaceutical preparation that has some amount of like a cosmetic slash pharmaceutical. And we do pharmaceutical testing here as well, um, according to the British Pharmacopoeia. So those tests sometimes can be applied to cosmetic products. So in general, we tell a person, submit about 30 grams of your product. Um, you need to inform us if there are any special storage instructions, such as it might be that you need to protect it from light, or it might be that it needs to be refrigerated. We need to know that beforehand so that the product can be kept in the way that you want it um, to ensure that when we test it, it is representative of what's actually happening in the product. We also recommend submitting it in your intended packaging because what happens is that when you submit a sample to us, one of the things that we're going to do is that we're going to send you a test report that is going to reflect what is on your product. So whether it be your brand or the batch number or the company name, et cetera, all of that information is going to be reflected. And so you want to make sure that that is on your labeling um, when you send it in for testing, um, because it will then be reflected on your test report and that provides kind of traceability to your product to say this report is from my product. Um, so what do we test for? As I said before, we do a total replicate count, a yeast and milk count and a sterility test in terms of our routine. This is from the bacteriological analytical manual from the FDA in the US. This is usually the test method we use for a lot of our products. Um, the replicate count just tells you how many um, mesophilic usually bacteria that are you know there and they, these are usually able to cause spoilage and these bacteria usually come from pretty much everywhere they're going to come from your raw materials they're going to come from the water um, they're going to come from any of the additives that you might you might be putting in it um, there's also yeasts and mold some of them these are also spoilage organisms are going to be coming from your plants so what you know on your plant leaves or stuff like that, especially depending on how you store your raw, raw materials. You could find that you're storing your raw materials in somewhere that's damp. Um, it might be dried leaves, but because of the dampness, it's increased the mold count. And because of that, that you now translates into your product having a high mold count. So these um, yeast and mold can be found, you know, pretty much air, soil, you know, on the plants. Um, we do what is called a sterility test as well. And that, is where we, in a sense, hold the product over a period of about seven days. And we it allows us to isolate any additional organisms that maybe we don't pick up in the counter of the yeast and mold count. And also to determine, because sometimes you have pathogens within the sample. So you have pathogens, disease-causing organisms, and these disease-causing organisms might be present in low quantities. And so if they're present in low quantities, when you do an air plate count, you may not pick them up. Only two per gram in there. And usually the limit for an area pay count because you have to dilute the product is about 10. So if it is in the product, it could still be um, something that's going to cause harm. So we do an, an enrichment and that allows us to determine whether or not 
um, these organisms are present. And then after that, we can isolate them and identify them. The positive sterility test is usually from any bacteria that is in the sample or maybe a yeast or a mold. There are some additional parameters um, that can be routinely assessed. And this is things like E. coli. Usually E. coli is um, an enteric pathogen that is going to cause diarrhea, vomiting, etc. However, it is not expected that it's going to be in a cosmetic. That's not something that you want to end up in your cosmetic. However, if you're starting with raw materials that are close to the soil, you may find that this particular organism is a concern. of your product and it is expected that you don't want as people might wash their hands or you know they might put a lotion on their hands or something and then they go eat like you don't want them to be transferring contaminants to things like that additionally there's an anaerobic plate count the anaerobic plate count oftentimes is looking for organisms like clostridium tetani um, which if the person has cuts or abrasions the the, the tetanus bacteria could get in there and um, cause them um, ill Candida albicans is known to cause skin infections. This is often present on our skin, um, in our gut, the mucosa, you know, the nose, different mucous membranes. And so what can happen is that during the manufacturing process, you know, depending on how the handling is done of the raw materials, you could introduce candida albicans to the product. And so, of course, that is also another parameter to test for because, of course, it can cause different infections. Staphylococcus aureus, as I mentioned before, oftentimes a food pathogen, oftentimes um, producing things like um, toxins. However, it can also cause skin infections. It's present in your skin. In your skin, on your in hair, your nose, your throat. Um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunistic pathogen, and that one is able to cause um, infections in your skin and eyes. Now, Pseudomonas is, I would say, the bane of the existence of many in the cosmetics industry, simply because of how it um, is kind of hard to kill. To be frank. Um, a lot of even disinfectant manufacturers will tell you like pseudomonas is one of those that's just very hard to kill. And once you get it in your in your production facility, sometimes it's difficult to get rid of because it's able to form what is called a biofilm. And so even though you are sanitizing, um, you're maybe in not scrubbing it enough, maybe just gently clean, you might find that a biofilm is present and that film protects the pseudomonas um, from the disinfecting agents and leaves them behind on the surface that was cleaned. So in general, cosmetics are not expected to have pseudomonas simply because they can indeed cause um, infection. And especially this is especially um, for persons who are immunocompromised or older or the especially young. Um, the non-routine parameters, I think Shade would have mentioned these, like things like efficacy of your antimicrobial pre um, preservation, as well as stability testing. So efficacy of antimicrobial preservation, what you're looking at in that instance is that you challenge your cosmetic with different organisms and to see if over time your cosmetic is able to either to kill them or result in no increase in growth. Because again, cosmetics, most of them, they're in tubs, we're gonna put our hands in, they're going to continually be exposed to repeated um, contamination by the person who's using them. And you don't want a situation where after you have sold your product um, and you said, oh, it can last 12 months, it's the, the client gets it. And in two weeks, because the antimicrobial preservation is not effective enough, it's spoiling on them in their month. Right. Um, additionally, so here are some requirements for cosmetics. These requirements um, are pretty much similar between the bacteriological analytical manual um, from the FDA and the ISO standard. However, the ISO will give you like specifics because it has the test methods um, um, indicated. So the ISO. So we'll specify that in one gram. Whilst, you know, so in general, your total number of microorganisms, and this includes the aerobic clay count and the yeast amount count that we mentioned before, that combined count should be less than a thousand for per gram for any 
um, cosmetic program or per meal, depending on the how the formulation is. Um, additionally, if it is in an eye area cosmetic or it's for children who are under three years old, then it must even have a lower limit, which is a less than 100 per gram or per meal. Um, Candida albicans should be absent, Staphylococcus aurea should be absent, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa should be absent. Um, some of the possible reasons why we get things that are out of spec. Um, we might have contaminated raw materials. As we mentioned before, sometimes we use a lot of natural products. It might be that we want to use aloe vera and we're using this you know, aloe vera plant for you know, our own backyard, E. coli. It might get contaminated while we're you know, putting it up with candida. Um, the water that we're using might have pseudomonas, things like that. So the raw materials may have Um, the organism that is there and our processed our products, um, improper hygiene, inadequate cleaning, contamination again from the water. Um, you have you might have inadequate or contaminated packaging. Maybe the packaging that you have isn't airtight. Maybe it allows for the entrance of microbes. You can also have improper storage and, and transportation. And this is especially for sometimes your raw materials. Um, if you're transporting your raw materials, for example, in a vessel or um, on the back of a truck or something that was used, for example, in a, on a farm with rot with um, animals, then you could have a situation where you have increase um, in the microbial contamination of those things with some of the pathogens, and this ends up in your product. And the other thing is that maybe your formulation is just off. Sometimes the formulation that you have is not sufficient to take care of all the microbes that you're putting in. So you may have a product that has a high microbial load and therefore, and with high water activity. And so the, you might realize that the bacteria can actually grow in the product. And so when you test it, it ends up out of specification. And that's why it's important to carry out some amount of risk assessment when you're looking at your product to see um, is my product a high risk product? You know, oftentimes this um, this is this is affected by what's the water activity, the pH, or perhaps um, or you're not using you know raw materials that are hostile to microbes. Um, in some of these conditions, what we find is that there are some products that intrinsically are just better well preserved. Um, especially when they have lower water activity because the microbes love water. Um, that is all that I have for you. I, I hope it was somehow beneficial and thank you for your time and attention. This is some of the references that I would have used and I hand over back to Mr. Lane. Dion, thank you so much. I now understand why I do what I do, because some of those names that you're calling, I'm sure that I would bite my tongue in pronouncing those words. And I can just imagine that maybe if I were to submit the samples, I would feel those tests as well. But I'm going to dub you the queen of microbes as of today. And thank you very much for your very informative, very engaging presentation. You know, I think we often take things for granted. Certainly, having come to work at the Bureau of Standards Jamaica, I recognize just how important, how important standards are and how important it is for us to follow guidelines and just keep doing what is required, what is established to ensure safety for all. Your presentation as well as Shadiz really underscores this. And I will point that out to our audience and to encourage them as you try to develop your business to just make every effort to ensure quality. And one of the ways we do this is through ensuring training for ourselves and for our staff. You know, we heard of good manufacturing practices often repeated by both Shade and Dion. And the Bureau of Standards Jamaica through its Quality Institute offers a range of training opportunities, including good manufacturing practices. These 
sessions, these courses can be accessed. And now, since the onset of COVID, we can do them virtually. We do them online. You don't need to leave the comfort of your home and you can organize with your team members and through the BR Standards Jamaica Quality Institute, you can be exposed to, for example, good manufacturing practices. And as you improve in your operations, there are several other things that can help you in terms of quality management systems, just to ensure that you know that how you do this thing, you do it consistently, you are record keeping, and just ensuring that ultimately, by the time it comes to me, and I'm going to use my scrub, um, except for my finger, if I, my finger gets dirty, as I will, based, based, based on the now, I, I don't even want to use stuff anymore um, because I figure that I'm going to be making mess of the things that I have to use. So do engage with the Quality Institute at the BR Standards Jamaica. Do engage with the, the do engage with the Quality Institute of the BR Standards Jamaica for training opportunities and certainly good manufacturing practices heard recommended by Shade and Dion important for us. I see two questions. We will take these two questions from Gabriel and Danian. So Gabriel, please go ahead and then to be followed by Danian. We'll take these questions and right after we will have a presentation from Mrs. Paulette Bailey. Gabriel? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask, does a, I saw all the microbial testing, you know, and I would assume it's mostly for lotions, body washes, but does a hard bar of soap need to have microbial testing too? that we use um sodium hydroxide in and and the second do i go ahead with the second question or wait i was about to ask dion or shade to chip in and answer but you could go ahead with the second question and is optifine a good preservative for lotions thank you for your questions gabriel Dion or Shade, will you be able to respond for me? Yes, so your bar soap does not, you do not need to do microbial analysis for your bar soap. So um, as Dion mentioned, certain harsh condition will prevent microbes from growing. And as you mentioned, you're using sodium hydroxide lye, which is uh, very basic. So I spoke about the pH scale. So um, your bar soap would have a pH as around nine. So you tend to not have microbes growing at that pH. Um, and the question about optifin, yes, it is a preservative that can be used in lotion. Thank you. Thank Shade. you. Gabriel, you're good with that? Fantastic. Thank All right, great. And thanks for the question. Danian, please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just a little bit curious to know how the BSJ regulates suppliers of packaging materials, because having heard the presentations, I kind of keep going back to some of the areas I will have bought packaging materials from, and I'm not sure I've ever seen any certification to say they have been vetted by the BSJ. So that's a little curiosity I'd like um, addressed. Well, let me just respond and to indicate that the Bureau of Standards Jamaica up to about 2015, 2016 was a regulator, but a regulator of processed food industry and the hollow concrete block making industry. The, that, and those particular rules of regulator, that particular role of regulator is no undertaken by the National Compliance and Regulatory Authority, the former regulatory division of the BSJ. But we do not regulate packaging per se in terms of packaging industry. We do not regulate. But what I say to you is that there are companies that have sought certification. Certification is really seeking to ensure that through their own processes, through their own testing of material, through their entire process, they are seeking to ensure the best quality for their 
various suppliers or their various clients, but we do not regulate. I am unable to say no if there would necessarily be a regulator of packaging per se. We can make some inquiries and if we can advise you on that, but the BSJ, while we have a range of standards, while we facilitate testing services, we do not regulate. And to the NCRA that does regulate, its parameters are processed food industry and the block making industry. There are some other elements that relate to health and safety that are monitored by the NCRA. There are other entities that are also involved in regulation. We have not mentioned, for example, the Ministry of Health and Wellness through their standards and their standards and regulatory division and the Ministry of Health will regulate some of the cosmetics or some of the items that we, our manufacturers will produce. Persons who are seeking to make claims for example, should reach out to the Ministry of Health and Wellness through its standard and regulatory division for guidance and for direction in that regard. I trust that helps, Dinian. Um, thank you so much. It does. I I'm in the process of setting up a, a glass bottle recycling facility, and so I have been in touch with the NCRA through your office. I'm grateful. I asked that question though because I've seen um, an alarming rate of of organizations that are now buying on a smaller scale packaging material and reselling them. Some of them are being transported with fertilizer. And so while that presentation was being conducted, you know, I kind of just remembered, hey, this is something I, I found a little alarming. And so I'd be happy to work with the Ministry of Health and your office to ensure that we're speaking directly. All right, let me thank you for your question. I recognize, I don't know if it is your background or somebody else's. So I'm going to ask the team if they could just check to see whose microphone may be open and to ensure that it's closed. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question and for the comment. We can seek to just be guided on the matter of who might actually monitor um, packaging. And I understand the concern. And this is why best practices, good manufacturing practices must be maintained and the persons need to ensure the integrity of the products that they put there. Um, so, so, some of what happens, I believe, Danian, has to do with the integrity of those of us who are involved in manufacturing. I see three hands. We cannot take all three questions. We did indicate we would have taken two. I will allow the question from Tanya Powell Edwards. I'm going to ask the other persons to put the questions in the chat or if it's a comment in relation to the previous questions, if you can just put that in the chat and one of our panelists or another technical person will seek to respond. Please. Uh, Thank you we for Thank you so much for taking the question. I'll ask it quick because I'm in a noisy location. Right. Um, Dr. Shade uh, spoke about the effic efficacy testing, um, but then said that the SRC does not have the facility for that particular one. Um, Ms. Price also spoke about it. So my question is, does the BSJ have the facility for the efficacy testing for the microbial preservation? Dion, really please state that and to that question. Sure, I'm not. Well, I'm. I'm just trying to verify if the. I believe should they spoke about something that would have been more the, the on the, along this, this the lines of research, the, you can see of antimicrobial preservation though that particular test is a little bit different, so that particular test the bureau can do which is simply just um, challenging the product with a particular microbe and testing it over time. So that particular test we can do. I believe the Shade had mentioned a different test um, that has to do with more research based in terms of how effective your product is. Um, Shade, if you can um, jump in to, 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 to expound on the test that you had 
indicated before, please. It was the one highlighted in red when she gave the presentation, and I think it had to do with preservation, but I stand to be corrected. Preservative. Can you hear me? Yeah, so the preservative challenge. Today, could you speak just a little bit louder? Oh. If you could, sorry. Okay, you hear me? Hearing you. Right, so the preservative challenge test, as Dianne mentioned, is where you have your you would introduce certain microbes into the product and write and assess. So see if there is an increase in growth of these microbe over a period of time. Um, so you are right. So we don't currently offer that service here. Um, what Dion was alluding to is where you mentioned efficacy testing now. I was saying that with efficacy testing, you're proving, you're going to prove that the product does what it claims. And I'm telling you that it's research, which requires some amount of investment and time. So it's not that we wouldn't be able to, we not, we cannot do it, is that we would have to assess store capabilities because uh, the type of test is dependent on the type of product. So we'd have to do some research initial research to determine what equipments are required, um, what special so special equipment, what expertise, et cetera, may be needed for the efficacy testing. And once the funding is available and you're willing to engage in a contract with us to so execute, it can be done. All right. All right. So the, as I said before, the, the BSJ does offer the, the efficacy of antimicrobial preservation. That test is offered here. All right. Thank you, Shade. Thank you, Dion. Sasha, I'm going to ask you, if you have not yet done that, please put your question in the in the chat. We do have three other presentations, uh, three other presentations that we do need to get through. It is 11.16. I'm going to ask that, uh, Paulette, if you could just be a little, be pointed as we speak to the labeling issues. And I see a question, somebody saying that they notice the labeling guidelines from the BSJ lean more towards processed food. We have a range of maybe up to 30 guidelines, 30 labeling standards, possibly more. And we have shared earlier the, we have shared earlier the cosmetics, um, so the listing of cosmetics. I'm gonna ask if we have the, the particular standard that would speak to labeling for cosmetics, just put that in the, in the, in the chat, Rion and Demar. All right. And then, of course, Paulette is coming in, so that is going to be shared here as well at any rate. We are very happy to have Mrs. Paulette Bailey, who has for the last maybe 15 years been employed to the Bureau of Standards Jamaica, working in the packaging non-metallic and furniture branch of the BSG. She has gained significant experience and is always keen on sharing her knowledge with her clients. We welcome Paulette Bailey to speak to us on labeling. Thank you so much, Mr. Leng. And I must commend Dr. Foster and Mrs. Price for their amazing presentation. I tell you, this, this is going to support my presentation a lot because a lot of what we asked for, you guys are the ones who the clients will need to come to, come to before they actually come to us. So thank you so very much, ladies. So of course, the aim of this presentation is to help you to appreciate the labeling standards which govern cosmetics and personal care products. And to, of course, hope that this will prevent a lot of um, persons not having their products labeled properly. Uh, no, Mr. Leng, I heard you asking about what a standard is. <laughs> I had it in my presentation. So what is a standard? It's really an agreed way of doing something. Right, people, one person cannot just come up with a standard. You would appreciate that a lot of tests no, and so no, forth are done no, before no. we actually can come up with standards. And it's applicable to goods, services, systems, 
And based on what we have heard today, we can agree that standards ensure safety, quality, and consistency, and of course, they are fundamental to trade. No, these are the two. Uh, if I might just inquire, Paulette, and thanks, so sorry. Uh, yes, I was asking about a standard. And are you presenting? Yeah. Are you? Well, if you're presenting, you are presenting to you what we would love to see. So... Oh, my God. <laughs> I was so sharing. Sharing with yourself. So let us just amend that. Are you seeing my presentation now? We are seeing your presentation, okay, not I'm yet in presentation, in presentation mode, right? No. Thank you so much. We wouldn't want you to oh, do all this work oh, and then keep it all to yourself. Thank you so not much. Not at all. <laughs> all right. Bless you. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Ling. So there we go. Our aim, standards, agreed way of doing something. And of course, it ensures consistency and it is fundamental, mental to trade. Now, these are, we do not have pat specific standards for cosmetic products, right? But these are the two standards that govern them. JS350, 2020 Jamaican Standard Specification for Labeling of Goods, Specific Requirements for Package Products. And JS349, both of these, as you can see, were recently done. So if you're purchasing standards, these are the two you should ask for. So what I have done really, I have taken out a part of the JS350 2020, which is what would be most applicable to your products, and I will expound on them. Now, what is a label? It's any anything that has to do with your product. It can be written, it can be electronic, it can be graphic, and it can also be on a separate or associated material. On your label, there are two main parts. You have the principal display panel, which we all know is the main panel, the part that the clients normally see, your customers normally see when they approach your product. And you have the information panel, which is also very important, which carries most of the very important facts about your product. Now, this is something that you need to know. You don't just have a package and you decide which part you're gonna make the principal display panel, right? In the standard, there are specific areas on the different types of packages that you will have to make the principal display panel. On a box with different size, with different sides, of course, the most, the, the large, one of the larger sides. Same with, with a bag, with a cylindrical container, about 40% of the product of the height and the circumference, right? So you multiply the height and the circumference and about 40% of that area. Sometimes you have a product and on it, you have a wrapper. All of that wrapper, if it is <laughs> small, right? So all of these are in the standards, they're here. And you can look and see what part of the of your specific package you will have to make the principal display package panel. On an ornamental container, though, you are allowed to use the bottom of that as your principal display panel, because of course, you know, most of the top will be decorative. Here's an example a box and a cylindrical object, one side. The larger side, of course, is a principal display panel. And on the cylindrical object, of course, about 40% of the area. Now, there are certain compulsory things that you must have on your label. And one of them is the product name, right? This is definitely emphasized because the product name is very important. It's a common or unusual name of the product. It can be a generic name or an appropriately descriptive term such as a statement of functions. Now, sometimes when you make up your products, 
it might not be anything that you have seen on the market already or anything that already have a, ger a generic name. But here you can have something descriptive or a statement of function. But of course, the name definitely has to has to state what is in the container. No, I'm not going to go through all of these in details, but all of these at some point or another, you may need to have on your product. Product name, as you heard, net quantity declaration, name and address of the principal place of business, country of origin, ingredient listing, batch code, date mark, instructions for you, storage instructions. Now, based on what is applicable to your product, you might not need to have all of these, right? If your product can be stored anyway, of course, you may not need to have storage instructions if the integrity of your product does not depend on it. The net quantity declaration. Now, if it is a liquid product, we need fluid measurement. So milliliters, liters, thereabout. If it's weight, we need it in solid measurement like grams, kilograms. Now, a lot of times we have uh, some misunderstanding with our clients and we may have fluid um, products and then we have grams or kilograms. So please make sure that if it's fluid, it is measured in the correct unit of measurement. If your product, however, is viscous, you're going to have to use solid measurement. So make sure it is in grams or kilograms. How it is positioned in the lowest third of the principal display panel in lines that are parallel to the base of the container. So you're not free to slip it on the side in a diagonal way or anything like that. It must be parallel to the base of the container. Now, you may not be aware of this, but based on the size of your principal display panel, the net quantity, the size of the net quantity declaration is dependent on that. So, for example, if the area of your principal display panel is less than five inches, then the net quantity declaration needs to be in letter height of at least 1 16th of an inch, which is approximately 1.6 millimeters, right? And so forth, you have the rest of it. What we do not, what we're trying to prevent is you having a very large principal display panel and then your net quantity declaration is very small. We want the customer to be aware of what it is that they are purchasing. Now, we also need to know where, who to contact in the event that we need to contact somebody about your product. And we need, a, need an address. It can be the address of the manufacturer, the distributor, the importer, any identifiable address. And we emphasize identifiable. It is not okay to just write the community. It is not okay to just write the parish. We need the address down to the street name and the number. We know a lot of you have difficulty with that because you're doing business at your home address. Um, we do not have any other exemptions for that, right? So just ensure that your address is complete and identifiable. Country of origin. We need to know where your goods was manufactured. Now the country of origin, speaks to the place where your goods was last changed to a significant level. So as you can see from this side, if you get the soap nodules from say Mexico and you process it and you have soap here, so whatever you make it in a bar of soap, then the country of origin would be in Jamaica, even though you got the raw material from another country. And that needs to be placed on your goods. Made in, product of, package, no, not packaging, manufactured in, assembled in. Your ingredient listing. This must be listed, as you heard from before, in decreasing order of predominance by weight or volume. And if you have an active ingredient, so that should be stated first, or those should be stated first in decreasing order of proportion and then the inert, and then the inert ingredients. 
Storage instructions, once the integrity of the product depends on it, you have to state it. Can be the shelf life or whatever. You need to state the storage instructions. Of course, if your product can be stored anyway and it still maintains its integrity, then that's fine. And if your product has a lifespan, we definitely need to see that on the products. And the instructions for use is very important, especially for these cosmetic products. Sad to say, we have had products without instructions for use. And, and it's not like a soap bar that you know you can use anyway. But if you want to make sure that the clients get the proper use from your product, then you have to tell them how it is that it is, how it is that they are to utilize it. From this slide, you can see that your principal display panel, you must have on it the name of the product and your net quantity declaration. Would that be your net weight or your net contents, right? Fluid, for fluid measurements, it has to be preceded by the words net contents. And for weight, of course, net weight. For solid products, has to be preceded by the words net weight. And those has to be on your principal display panel. Everything else can be on other parts of the label, which is your information panel. Presentation. Now, of course, you can have everything on the label and it's not clearly presented. That will be unacceptable. So you have to make sure that you, in addition to Ensuring that you honor the letter sizing, you have to make sure that it is clear because if the font is not, if you don't have a proper font and you have the correct letter sizing, it can still um, not be clear to your consumer. So you have to make sure that that is okay. And where the statements of common name, manufacturer's name, or the address or country of origin consist of more than one word, they must be in letters of identical size and style of print. Now, this may not seem like something very important to you. However, what we have noticed is that based on how sometimes, especially the product name is written, it is difficult to, to figure out what is the correct name of the product based on the different fonts that they're in. So therefore make sure that these are in the same fonts. And all required information shall be in the official language or languages of the country it is being sold. And of course, for Jamaica, it must be in the English language. Labels for approval must be printed to the actual representation. So sometimes you may take in labels to us and we look at it and we know that this is a one fluid ounce or a 60 milliliter product and the label is very big we know that this is not the actual size and sometimes you do that you take in something that is enlarged to us and then you take it home and you reprint it and you put something that's very small on the market that the clients cannot see so in order, in order to prevent that, we ask that when you are taking your labels to us, that you present it at the actual size. Now, claims. No, this is something that we really have a lot of issue with, issues with because a lot of products that come in are organic and there is no organic certification. No, we do not accept that. We understand the organic process and we know that it's a very detailed process and no product, by the way, can be accepted as being organic unless they are certified. So once you are taking in your organic products, make sure you take in your certifications. Along with that, outside of that, you are not allowed to put organic on it. Our NCBJ, um, branch can help you with your organic certification. For health claims, now the authority on health is not the Bureau of Standards, it's the Ministry of Health. So therefore, once you are having any health claim at all on your product, you have to go through the Ministry of Health for them to substantiate it. 
we get that a whole lot. And also the claims. We heard from Dr. Foster earlier on how testing can be done to see if your product for sure can prevent wrinkling and things like those. Your claims have to come with some form of, um, you have to substantiate your claim. And of course, you're allowed to put the national flag on your, or any national symbol on your products. However, again, we're not the authority on that. Any national symbol that you need on your product, you have to go to the office of the prime minister. And they, of course, will give you, will, will do the requisite vetting and give you the permission. They'll give you a letter, which you'll take to us. And then, of course, we can okay your label after that. Now it is responsible of any person who manufactures, sells, or distributes any goods to ensure that they are labeled as required by these standards. Those are your responsibility. So thank you very much. That ends my presentation. Thank you so very much, Paulette. Thank you for that very detailed, very brief, very succinct presentation. We appreciate the information, particularly those things. I know a lot of persons wish to have the Jamaican flag on their products and for the fact that you're pointing them into the correct direction. Of course, information regarding labels or labeling can be accessed through the packaging and non-metallic branch here at the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. Questions regarding labeling standards or labeling standards can be accessed through the Technical Information Center. I do know two hands. However, we do have a time constraint. Might I ask Anik and Sasha to raise those questions in the chat? We will respond to them in the chat. But we were hoping to be out of here by midday, which may or may not happen. We have to make a quick adjustment. In fact, we, the, the, in terms of the, the program flow, just because we got such a detailed presentation from our early speakers in terms of the technical, your technical foundation to allow you the start, we now have to just make a shift. And Colin, sorry, I was messaging. I don't even think the message has gone to you yet. Will you just please allow, we will need to facilitate Joan's participation in another activity near to midday. So Colin, we have to just break the circle a little bit and we'll take Joan now. So just as Joan seeks to present, we the business development aspect critical, and that is what we want to do. We don't want to rush that, but we are going to just take the presentation on export requirements and opportunities prior to the business development section so that we will have some quite some time to focus on that. I will ask you to, John, you may go ahead and the presentation will be projected for you. And um, of course, Sasha, please just share your question and we will respond in the chat. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll be presenting on important considerations for preparing for export markets. Um, next slide, please. So the areas we'll be looking at, sorry, could you go back? Thank you. The areas, thank you. The areas we'll be looking at um, are basic export requirements, planning for export, assessing the target market, assessing supply capacity, distributor relationship and key issues, market feedback. Thank you. Next slide. So just to understand the role of JAMPRO, um, our mandate is to drive Jamaica's economic development through growth in investment and export. And JAMPRO is an agency of the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. And our market development role is to leverage relationships to help buyers and exporters convert trade opportunities into increased sales. Next slide, please. Um, so basic considerations for export, this would include packaging, labeling, and branding, which the Bureau of Standards already spoke to, IP protection, um, and that is registering your name, your mark, your brand in all the target markets. And many persons have had their brands stolen, or you may find yourself infringing on someone else's mark if you may not, and you may be sued for this. 
And this can be done through JIPO, um, the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, which is here, here at Jump, on the JAMPO building, 18 Trafalgar Road. Also, market research, targeting, and this includes consumer taste, the culture, purchasing power, environmental considerations, standards, and quality, and the capacity. So just a quick, um, in some quick information on consumer taste. So what um, rose water, which Jamaicans use as an ingredient in baking, is used as a cosmetic product in Trinidad. Um, so this would, one would have to do some research to know that, to know that um, if you're entering into the Trinidadian market, your product, if you're doing rose water, would not be in um, the baking aisle. It might be placed in the cosmetics aisle. Also, market access. And this, um, this is important to note as well, because the importing country might impose a duty or a tariff on your product, which can range from 0% as far as up to 40%. And in some special cases, it may even go up to 50%, um, in, as in, for example, in the case of firearms. The country may even additionally add a value-added tax, which is similar to GCT. Trade agreements are also important to know, um, as this may help to mitigate um, the duty imposed um, on the, um, the tariffs. We encourage persons to advantage existing trade agreements through the trade board, as many exporters are not benefiting from them. And an example of um, one, one trade agreement would be the Caribbean Basin Initiative. And this is a trade agreement between Jamaica and the US, where 30% of the input to the product has to come from Jamaica. And this can come in the form of labor, raw material, or, or utilities. Again, the trade board will make this assessment. Um, exporter registration. This used to be done by JAMPRO for many, many years, and this has now moved to the Jamaica Customs um, since last year, October, October 31, 2013. So um, the exporters carrying out export shipments will go directly to the Jamaica Single Window for Trade, that's JSWIFT, that platform operated by Jamaica Customs to access relevant permits licenses, certification from the, go the relevant government agencies. Next slide, please. Regulations and laws, and this entails the sale of your products in the market, including warranties, return policy, and after-sale services. Um, logic logistics is also important. Um, and this can be complicated and you can also have legal implications if not done correctly. So just be sure that you have hired a knowledgeable customs broker or freight forwarder. Distribution channels. And this is really getting your product into different retail outlets. And this jumper can help you within finding a suitable distributor. Marketing and promotions. You have to... Um, Market your, 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 your product in, in the geography that you're entering to, because it makes no sense. Persons in that country, that region, they don't know about your product. They don't know where to get your product. Um, and demonstrate some level of success in the domestic market, as no buyer wants to purchase um, from a supplier who doesn't have a successful track record. Next slide, please. All right. Um, have an export marketing plan. And this it should include your price, your product, place, and promotion. Those are the four important Ps that should be included in your export marketing plan. Um, set clear objectives. And you should one should look at your sales volumes, your pro profits, your revenue, number of new markets. That is, if you want to enter into new markets, your customers and your timelines. Define your target market and your objectives. Look at which demography you want to target. Is it old, the older demography, the younger dem demography? Is it at certain a certain geography you would like to target? Your market segment, your supply chain. Ensure that, ensure, sorry, but your supply chain. En ensure that you have a robust supply chain because you can't have an order to fill in two weeks and you have a bottle order in order to fill that order coming in next four weeks arriving from China. Have a sound financial plan. 
And this should include your inflows and outflows to ensure that you're making a profit and you can finance your product. Next slide, please. Identify and target the market segment. We spoke about that already. Evaluate the price levels, the trends, know what is happening in that, that segment. Know your competitors. Identify issues that may be entry barriers for your product. And one example of an entry barrier is can be the FDA, because they're, they're, they're requiring that if you sell a certain amount of cosmetics to the US, you have to register with them. But at, at this point, no cosmetic manufacturer in Jamaica is at that threshold. So just be aware of this so as to not get into trouble with the FDA. And Jampro has already circulated this article to our cosmetics database. So if you want if you want us to recirculate it or if you didn't get a copy of that, we can share it with you. Research your distribution channels. Examine shipping routes and the costs, as some shipping routes might be more expensive to go through than others. Determine appropriate logistics partners. Cost, know your cost, get your, as I said, get knowledgeable customs brokers, consolidators, um, agents, career office, and the post office. Next slide, please. Assess your capacity to enter your chosen market. Can you fill orders from that market and to service the market? Are you adaptable? Are you agile? This is very important. Um, as just an example of this is as recent as COVID, um, how that affected businesses worldwide. It slowed down shipping, so importation of raw material was affected and shipping to your destination became more expensive. Even though this is an extreme example, businesses have to be prepared to adapt. Determine the impact of the resource requirements on your domestic marketing and sales efforts. Sometimes businesses have to assess their internal capacity because as you export, there is the temptation to divert products from the local market to satisfy demands of the overseas market. So just know what requirements, those requirements on your domestic market. Thank you. Um, assess also your operating standards, the product quality, production capacity, raw material availability. Be consistent in your products because no buyer wants to get your product perfect the first shipment and then the second shipment, some of the items are faulty. Your human resources financial resources, and your overall competitiveness. Next slide, please. Appoint a distributor to handle your product um, and ensure clear, unambiguous contract terms. Is, is it that once the, the product, product reaches the port overseas, is it that we are, where the contract ends? Is it that the buyer will pick it up from there? Or is it the contract, does it entail that you, 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 you drop it to the, to, to the buyer's factory? So that those things, the small things like that need to be extremely clear because these can become legal matters. Check the background, the reputation and performance of a distributor because there have been instances where some of these, these distributors have known to be, for, for want of a better word, scammers. So it's best if you, you know, people want to keep information to themselves and say so it's my business and I'm not sharing, um, sharing information with my competitor. But sometimes it's good to talk and because that person, your, even your competitor might have had a bad experience with that distributor and you wouldn't have known if you hadn't mentioned it to them. Get recommendations, referrals. Seek to develop a winning partnership with your distributor. Next slide, please. And key questions, you can ask a distributor, are they financially strong? If, it need to, if you even need to ask them for audited financials, do they have the facilities needed to service the market? Is the distributor linked into the right network to sell your product? How important is your product in his product mix? You don't want to be in a situation where your distributor doesn't see the value in your product and does, is not prioritizing your product um, in, in the market. There is also e-commerce and social media marketing. Persons are more, com more and more companies are selling their companies on online platforms like Amazon and their own Carib Shopper. You can promote your products through YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Next slide, please. And just in summary, focus on your product and aim to be the best in that, in that area. Know your market, know your competitors, 
manage well all processes from factory to market, support your product in the market, and plan to visit as, of, of, as often as possible because you need to know your market and know, know the market that your product is in. Utilize social media and e commerce. Honor your commitments and communicate. Communicate to your buyer and don't tell untruths. If you can't meet an order, just, just communicate. Be very clear. You'll find that the buyers will appreciate honesty than you know, telling, you know, trying to come up with, with something and it's not true. It's all about relationships, build partnerships, and make them solid. Next slide, please. So Jumper offers um how Jumper can assist your support you in exporting. We offer business information. So we have an exporter facilitation department that provides export advisory services and hosts various information sessions and on workshops on a number of subject areas to improve exporter competitiveness. We also have inward missions um, where Jampro introduces, introduces buyers to exporters um, virtually, or if you, if some at times we'll invite them to visit Jamaica and even come out, come out to your factory to 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 have meetings to see see how you're you're producing your product. Next slide, please. We also um have trade fair participation where Jamper coordinates participation in various trade shows, and this is done on a cost sharing basis with with the suppliers. We also have outward missions. Um, where Jumper organizes outward missions into market. So we help you to take your product into market, help you to get your product overseas. And um, buyer recruitment, we facilitate buyer introduction to entities that are export ready. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you. Any questions? Sasha has a question for you. We'll take this one question from Sasha Cardio. Hi. Yes. So earlier I was asking what are the penalties for not complying with these standards? I I know that they'll charge you. Um, because I, I remember one incident where I was speaking to one of our um our clients and they were saying that somebody had not adhered to some some requirement and the government had charged them some, some exorbitant fees um and this was in the millions so you can be charged very, very steep penalties if you don't adhere to them okay um you mentioned using social media to promote your products and in in the cosmetic industry i realize that a lot of persons that's what, that's what they're doing using social media instagram mm -hmm. youtube and then Persons would reach out to them for the product, be it local or overseas. Um, how do you address a cosmetic supplier, local, a small business person just going to the post office or using DHL or FedEx to ship off their product? How I'm, not do sure, you address I'm, not, I'm not sure. How do we address them? How we support them? I mean, with all the standards that Jampro has that you just spoke about, mm -hmm. what would, how, how do you come into play where that is concerned? Because that's what's happening now. People are just using the post office or FedEx well, or DHL. Well, our main mandate here at Jampro is to increase export sales. So we would meet with the the client to see where they are in terms of their capacity. Is it that they we can assist in them increasing their products? Do they need a larger factory space? Um, do they need sometimes they just need grants, you know, financing? So we can help them in in, in identifying financing, um, or in other, any other area that they might need support in. We will try to to assist them. Is it that they need to understand the overseas market some more? So we'll walk them through that. Is it that they can, as I said before, benefit from some trade agreements? So we just need to find out where the gaps are in with that company, and then we'll walk them through to increase their capacity. Okay, to get them on a basically larger market. Exactly, because our okay. focus is on export, getting companies to a level where they are ready to export and get their product overseas. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you. Thank you for that, Sasha. Um, Chrissy, we do note your hand. I'm going to ask you to put that question in the chat as we try to maximize the time. You have been a really great audience, but we also want to respect the time and to try to wrap up as close as possible to 12. Um, Joan has to leave, so just thank you, Joan, for that presentation. I like how kind you were to us when you said, um, don't tell untruths. <laughs> and simply put, I'll tell people, don't tell no lie. When we enter into business, the thing that will make our businesses work is integrity. Is the way we operate, is our word being our bond. It is utilizing standards so that we don't even have to see, consider what the penalties are because we are going to do what is required so that we don't run afoul of the law, whether here in Jamaica or overseas. We don't want to expend money to export and then the products have to be dumped, thrown away because we have failed to do what we need to do. So thank you again for your presentation and we will be in touch. All the very, very best. And although our circle, the way we had scheduled this presentation, we were going to be looking at the business development aspect before going into the export. But as we heard, jo Joanne, who is representing Jampro, has to be in another training session, which starts at midday. But just based on all the things that Joanne mentioned, I think it is an opportune time for us to introduce our next presenter, our final presenter for the morning, Colin Porter, who is Technical Services Manager at the Jamaica Business Development Corporation, where he coordinates the activities of that technical team. And this includes, of course, providing support to clients in the areas of product development, so matters that we have spoken about already, branding and packaging of design, operations improvement across several sectors and industries, and making us ready not only for things Jamaican, but things Jamaican overseas. So I think, Colin, you come in right at the opportune time to anchor all of what we have said already. Thank you so much. You're muted, Mr. Porter. Yeah, Colin, we're not hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was so eager to get started. I thought I was unmuted. But thank you very much. And I agree with you in the placing of my presentation. I was just listening. When, when you look at the build up from Shady leading downwards from the deep technical stuff um, coming to Joanne's presentation, I think uh, my presentation will help to really put a cap and, and hopefully put a lot of things in perspective um, from a business opportunity point of view, because for us at JMD, and you may go to the first slide for me, um, it's about providing that business opportunity and allowing persons to function a particular way. And this first slide basically just kind of sets the background of what it is that we do at JBDC as Mr. Ellis mentioned earlier, we are one of the agencies in Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce as 